so often you hear people say that a particular verse is their life verse. Have you heard that before? It's something that they hold on to for their whole life. And it just has great meaning and great value to them. We should all have those. But I also believe that we should have some verses that we should anchor our soul in Christ in. And if you don't mind, and even if you do mind, I don't care. I'm still going to do it. Share some of those verses with you today. And some of these verses are going to help you just live out your life in Christ on a daily basis. So often... Not only non-believers, but believers will say at times, I don't know why I exist. Maybe you felt that way. Maybe you feel that way today. What's my purpose in life? Why am I here? What's, what's life all about? I have no clue. Well, we can understand people in the world that don't know Christ to say things like that. But I've run across a lot of Christians who express the very same thing. I, I don't know why I exist. I have no clue. Well, I have the answer. And it's a very simple answer. It's found in the Word of God. And you go, yeah, Pete, you're a pastor. Everything's found in the Word of God. Well, you're right. Everything is found in the Word of God. But I have not the whole Bible to tell you why you exist. I have one verse it will tell you why you and every other human being alive exists. And it's found in Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. Revelation 4, 11. I love the way that King James says it. It says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. Now, some of your versions are going to say, And for Thy joy they are and were created. By the way, my PowerPoint, I won't put the verses up there. I'll put the reference up there. So you're going to have to write them down. I'm not going to put the verse up there because I believe you need to go find them in your Bible. It's a lazy church that has nothing but verses up there and people never open their Bibles. I tell our people, get your fingers cracking, get them working, get them warmed up. You've got arthritis, get them lubricated. Start flipping because there's nothing better to a pastor's ears than to hear the Bibles. Hear the Bibles going. I know you, some of you might have iPads and all those things that have Bibles. At least get the, the pages, even though they don't make noise. Do that. I know that there's one, one application that you can read a book, and when you go like this, it turns the page. You hear the page turning. That cracked me up. It sounds just like that. When you turn a page, it sounds funny. Revelation 4.11 is why we exist. We have been created to bring God pleasure. You want to know why you exist? You exist to simply bring God pleasure, to bring him joy. What, what greater sense of life is there than that? To know that we exist for the purpose to bring our Heavenly Father pleasure. Now, the question that we need to ask, what actually brings God pleasure? Well, let's be honest. We could actually go an entire year, if not longer, and pick a verse out each Sunday and take a look at that verse and how that would bring God pleasure. You know what I mean? Obviously, we don't have time. So I'm just going to pull out a couple of them, okay? One of the famous ones you know is when Nicodemus, a Pharisee, came to Jesus in the Gospel of John, chapter 3. And he began to talk with him. And said, we know that you're a teacher sent by God for all the things that you have done. And Jesus just cut right to the core. He said, Nicodemus, you must be born again to enter into the kingdom of God. You must be born again. And Nicodemus was perplexed. He goes, what do you mean be born again? How can a man go inside his mother's stomach again? You can't do that. You can just see the wheels turning. <laughs> this Pharisee's not getting it. And Jesus said, oh, Nicodemus, Nicodemus, that which is, you know, born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. You must be born of water. That's not baptism, by the way. You know, if someone tells you that that's what that verse means, no, you're not. When you're born into this world, what are you born out of? Water, right? The water sack breaks. You come out with the water. 
And so you must be born physically is what Jesus is saying. And then he says you must be born spiritually. That's being born again. Born again. And then there's that famous verse that every Christian should know that is listed right there in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him should not perish. Whosoever should believe. Oh, what a powerful verse that is. Well, what does it mean? Believe in what? Well, that's that love that God has. God knew that when he created man, they would fall. And he gave man free will. He gave the angels free will. Did you ever think about that? Here's a freebie. I'll just throw out free will for you, what it's all about. Why do all these things happen? Because God gave everything he created free will. The angels in heaven had free will. A third of them chose to use that free will and rebel. Thus, Satan, Lucifer, came about, and the demons, the workers of iniquity, a third of the angels who were in heaven worshiping God chose not to, and they're demons now. They used their free will against God. God took Adam and Eve and placed them in the garden and said, everything's yours, but don't touch that one tree. Don't touch that one tree. Well, Satan came down to see they exercised their free will, they use their free will, and sin entered into the world, and sin nature came into the world. And you know, I know I see a little baby. Where's that baby right over there? Did, did she just walk out? Oh, there she is in the back. I wish you weren't having that baby cover. You hold that baby up, and it looks like an angelic being, right? Oh, it's so precious. But you know that little sweetie pie is born with a sin nature. <laughs> Let me ask you this question. When that little baby grows up a little bit more and they see a little toy that Cousin Sally's playing with and they walk over there and they grab it and they go, mine, mine, mine. Did you have to teach them how to do that? When you tell your little child, okay, these cookies are for the people we're going to take on the street. You know, give them to the street. Don't you eat any of these chocolate chip cookies. They're not for you today. And you walk back in, and they got chocolate all over their mouth and going down their throat. And you look at them and say, now, Johnny, did you eat that chocolate chip cookie? <laughs> no. <laughs> did you have to teach them to say no? That's the sin nature. We, as parents, have to raise them in godly fashions and let them know how to live their lives. <clears throat> so we know that there's a sin nature. And because of free will, God has given mankind the opportunity to either choose God and his ways or to choose the world and its ways. And it says, for whosoever shall believe, anyone who will believe, in other words, who will use their free will to take that plan of redemption that God gave us with Jesus on the cross, exercises their free will, and they now become born again. Now, what's the purpose of free will? Well, if you take a look all the way back into the last book of the Bible, into the book of Revelation, there's something there in chapter 19. And there in chapter 19, verses 7 through 9, you can read it later, it's called the marriage supper of the Lamb. What a glorious concept when you understand the marriage supper of the Lamb. God is going to take every single person who has exercised their free will and has accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and Lord, given their life to him, at the end of our life, whether it's through just we grow old and we die, or we go in the rapture, there's going to be a period. After the rapture of seven years, you know about it, the tribulation period, which is a phenomenal study. It starts all the way back in Daniel. Actually, it starts way back when God laid out the law to him about following the laws of the land. That's a whole other story. We could have fun with that one. But we see that these people here who have accepted Jesus are going to be part of the bride of Christ. They're going to be united with Christ. God did this whole thing of free will that humanity, human beings, can choose to accept Jesus. And if they choose to accept Jesus, they become the bride of Christ united with him and there is a picture of that we become one with christ we're not going to become god don't no mormonism here we're not going to become god 
but we're going to become one with him. We recognize that when God laid out the roles of marriage. There in Ephesians chapter 6, where it talks about a woman submitting unto a man. And by the way, women, you don't have to submit if it's ungodly stuff they want you to do. Okay? Know that. Because the husband's supposed to be representing Christ. And Christ would never have you do anything ungodly. Matter of fact, a husband is supposed to love you as Christ will love the church and gave himself for it. And sometimes us guys, we're a little thick. Because the Bible says, women, submit yourselves under, the, uh, under your husbands as under the wives. Only tell the women one time to submit. The husband's down below. He tells us twice to love our wives. First, love your wife as Christ loved the church. And second, love your wife as you love yourself. That's because we're pretty egotistic sometimes and we love ourselves. You don't think so? Check yourself out in the mirror next time you look. <laughs> not bad, not bad. <laughs> you betcha. Now, you won't admit it, but you watch yourself in the mirror from now on. You'll be doing some of that stuff. He tells us twice. Why? Because we're a little thick sometimes. But then it goes on and it says this that a man shall leave his mother and his father and they shall cleave to his wife and they too shall become one flesh. Now listen to this. And this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. The marriage supper of the Lamb, being united with Christ. You see what's saying there? You see what he's saying there? And what is amazing about marriages and what marriages are supposed to be about is a advertisement, if you would, a reflection of what God offers humanity. A man and a woman spiritually become one. And when we're united with Christ, when we've given our hearts to him and that pleases him, we're going to go through the marriage supper of the Lamb and be united with him. So next time you think about, you know, my marriage, ugh, think about are you representing Jesus in your marriage the way you're supposed to? Am, am I the priest of the family representing Jesus in the marriage? A, a, am I the advertisement to my neighbors and to my community and to the fellows at work? And the fellows at work talk about how lame their wives are. You can stand up and say what a blessing and a gift of God you got because God has brought that special woman to you. Oh, sometimes that woman God will use to be sandpaper in a file, but that's important. <laughs> we need that. It's important because in life with our mates and with other people, we'll either clang or we'll sharpen. You take your kitchen knife and you start whacking it on a piece of metal, you're going to put chips in it. But you take another piece of metal and you just start doing this, you're going to make it a nice, sharp instrument. And God brings people together if they understand that and they make them a nice instrument sharp instrument for the glory of God. So marriage is a very important thing. We could spend a lot of time on that. It's a fun subject. But when you're giving your life to Christ, you're going to be able to be part of the marriage supper of the Lamb, and that pleases God. That's the whole purpose of this whole existence here on earth, that mankind has exercised their free will to become part of the bride of Christ. So there's a couple things right there that bring pleasure to God that we give our lives through salvation to Christ and we look forward to being united with him here's another simple one you can find it in <clears throat> excuse me in Philippians chapter 2 verse 5 and you know that verse it says let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus what a wonderful verse that is. Let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Can you stop and think about that for a moment? I, I don't know if you guys, some of you are pretty young, but they used to have bumper stickers and everything. What would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? WWJD. What would Jesus do? D. So that's a good saying. It should be around us. We should think about that all the time. And no matter what situation we're facing, no matter where we're going, what would Jesus do about this? A temptation comes. What would Jesus do with this temptation? A thought crosses our mind. What would Jesus do with that, that thought? There? What would Jesus do? Boy, what an amazing thing that is. Do you know that if everybody in the world would do that, we would not have to have armies? 
we would not have to, sorry, we wouldn't have to have police. We wouldn't have policemen. Oh, we need firemen because fires would probably still go and people, you know, would fall and car accidents and things like that. But we would not have wars and all terrorists and all these things going on because everyone would be thinking like Jesus would be. What a wonderful thing. And don't you think that pleases God for us as individuals when we want to please God, when we want to be in his will? And that, that's another thing. A lot of people say, that's exactly what I want. I want to be in God's will in my life. And that's another anchor that we're going to be looking at now. But I really don't know how to be in God's will. Well, let me explain God's will real simple. There's basically two wills of God, if you would. There's the general will of God, and there's the specific will of God. The general will and the specific will. Now, the general will of God is things that you can do wherever you live. You can do it in El Centro. You can do it in St. Paul. You can do it in Iraq. You can do it in Nicaragua. You can do it in Russia. You can do it in China. It doesn't matter where you live or what you do. You can do these things any place. In Jerusalem, you can do them, and you can do them in any city that you can think about in the world. The general will of God. Now, let's take a look at that for just a moment. What is the general will of God? What are some of the concepts? Turn your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians, would you please? Over there, we're going to take a look at chapter 5. Now, let's bounce up. I know it says 16, but let's start in 15 where it says, See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good, both for yourself and for all. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecy. Test all things and hold fast to that which is good. See, every one of those things that I've just read to you, you can do here in St. Paul, Minnesota. You can do it in El Central, California. You can do it in prison. You can do it on a ship in the middle of the ocean. All these things are the general will of God. You can do them anywhere at any place. Rejoice always. Do you know as Christians that this is what God has called you to do is to rejoice always? I mean, that's the word of God. That's what we should do. But do you know that so many Christians are like a cartoon character? Eeyore out of Winnie the Pooh? I mean, everything's a cloud. You know, just dark cloud. How you doing, Eeyore? Everything's fine. I'm blessed. A wonderful day, can't find my tail. <laughs> I mean, you see Christians like that? Now, be honest. You see them in the supermarket, and you go, oh, I hope they didn't see me, and you run down the other aisle because you don't want to get rained on by these people. They're just a cloud of depression, and yet the joy... Well, you know them. You know what I'm talking about. But it says rejoice always. I mean, we need, to, we need to understand that God wants us to be happy people. I mean, can you imagine street witnessing? I'd like to tell you about Jesus. It's the most wonderful, <laughs> glorious thing I have ever experienced. And I want you to be just as happy as me. <laughs> Right on, brother, give it to me. I mean, what kind of magnet is that? Oh, back off, dude. Rejoice. God wants us to have that pleasant demeanor and that blessing of life going on in our life. Uh, pray without ceasing. We need to constantly be praying. Well, I can't pray all the time. Well, my goodness, you better be praying all the time. Well, no, no, I've got to concentrate. I've got to do it. Well, sure, you can concentrate. But can't you, in the middle of your work, Father, would you give me wisdom for this right now? I, I, I really want this to come out really good. Instead of going, I'm going to make this really good. 
Father, would you help me make this really good? You can do your yard work. How many of you do your yard work? <laughs> 18 more passes. <laughs> 17 more. Oh, my gosh, what a waste of time. God has blessed us with an acre with a lot of grass. The front yard has five sections of grasses on it, and it's a turf grass. So you need to cut it by hand. The back, it's not turf, so I, don't, I jump on a little tractor and we cut that one, or I do. Five sections. I have five people in my family. The first section over here is for my oldest daughter. This section is for my second daughter. This section is for my son, Peter. He gets a lot of prayer. <laughs> He's a good boy. He's getting his straight. It's going straight now. It's great. And then the other side over there, it's for Marcy and I. And I just cut, and I may not pray the 100% time on every single step I'm making, but I'm praying. Because sometimes you got to stop and, you know, pick something up or you have to do something. And then I, but I just pray. I pray over them. So I utilize that time as I'm doing it. Pray without ceasing. I go back there and I, my tractor lawnmower, I was told I needed to blow all the grass off underneath of it. So when I blew, blow the deck off, I have this gas blower. Well, the other day, I'm going like this. And I'm, oh, Come on, God. Oh, wait a minute. That's not a prayer. That's a complaint. <laughs> Sorry about that, Lord. And I go, God, I've been pulling. Would you, would you bless me and start it this time, please? Please. Remember, it's 107 out there. <laughs> oh, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> and I'm utilizing that time, pray without ceasing. Driving down the road, someone cuts you off. You jerk! That's not a prayer, by the way, if you think about that. <laughs> I don't care who taught you that. That's not a prayer. They cut you off. Lord Jesus, there's something going on with that person to be that rude. Would you have somebody come by them today and share the gospel of Jesus? Utilize that time. Pray without ceasing. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. It goes on and it says... In everything, give thanks. Now, this is where we get theologically a little difficult because there are some times that it's very difficult to give thanks. Amen? You know, our, our first daughter married, and after a year or so, they want to have their first child. They're so excited. They get pregnant, and we get a phone call. She had a miscarriage after six, seven, eight weeks. And it was just devastating. You know, and you're supposed to, you know, the Bible says it right here, in everything, give thanks. And it's difficult sometimes to give thanks in life. It, it really is. But at the same time, that's what the Word says. So what do we do when difficult things like that happen? What do we do when, when Chuck falls off the ladder and hits his head? What do we do when those times of difficulty in life come about that we don't understand? Well, the only thing that I can do in my life, what I have learned, when I come into things that I don't understand, I go to the things I do understand. And this I understand that Romans 8.28 says, and I know, it doesn't say and I think, and I know that all things work together for the good for those who love God and are called according to his purposes. Boy, there's an anchor to your soul. If you know that all things work together for the good, it does not say, my version, and I've looked at a lot of versions, even the message, and it does not say all things are good. It says all things work together for the good. So then we understand if God is sovereign, then God has a purpose. And if he has a purpose, then we can trust him forward even in difficult times. And that can be tough. I know I've had people in their marriages that are ready to literally kill themselves. They just hate their spouses. And there's the biblical principles that if we follow... God can heal any marriage whatsoever. And I'll sit there and I'll tell them, now you have a choice. You can choose to follow the biblical principles or you can follow your flesh. Flesh is going to end you to divorce, even though that's not pleasing to God. It'll still go that direction and God gives you free will to go that way. Or you can follow the biblical principles and God can bring healing. It's going to take time. 
trust will have to be built back up. But God can heal that and restore and rebuild. And then one day, this horrible mess that you think you can hardly live through, you'll be able to sit across the couch or a coffee table from somebody, and they're saying our marriage is a shock. There's no hope. There's no way that this could ever happen to save our marriage. And you can share how horrible your marriage was and what God did for you. So things will work together for the good if you allow them to. So that's a great, important, valuable principle that we can find. So the other things that are there that are just as important, giving thanks. We need to be a people to give thanks to God. How often do we just take from God and never say thank you? Have you noticed that? God blesses you and you've gotten so used to his blessings you don't even say thank you anymore. Have you noticed that? We just, we just expect them. But God wants, don't you like to have someone say thank you to you when you've done something nice? It's, it's a, a polite thing to do. Well, it brings pleasure to God when we say thank you, God, for the blessings that you bestowed on me this day. Thank you for that opportunity. Thank you. So we need to be people that have hearts of thanksgiving. Another verse that you can look at that gives you the general will of God is Acts 2.42. And it says there that they continued steadfastly in the apostleship's doctrine, in fellowship, breaking of bread, in prayer. Four things right there that the early church did when they got saved. Every day they were in the word of God. Every single day. Oh, they didn't have the, the Bible that we have. They didn't have this precious book. But they had the apostles that for three and a half years walked with Jesus. And during that time, they learned from Jesus. And as they learned from Jesus, the people would go and they would talk to those people about what Jesus taught them. The word of God. They were in the word of God. How many of you are going to eat today? Be honest. Raise your hand. The rest of you that are not raising your hand, look around, folks. You see liars in the church. <laughs> All right. How many? Yeah, there's two hands now going up. How many of you are going to eat tomorrow and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday? You're going to eat this week, aren't you? You're going to sit down and enjoy it probably three times or eight times a day. You're just <laughs> going to have a fun time with food. Food's great. I love it. It loves me. That's why I love it. Now, oh, I started thinking about ice cream. I better not go there. <laughs> now, stop and think. You're going to go and you're going to eat physical food all week, every day, unless you fast for the day or something. You're going to do that, right? But how many of us this week are going to, after church today, go home and put our Bibles down and not pick it up until next Sunday? There's so many people that will be like that. We will end up not feeding our soul the word of God. But we'll feed our flesh, but we won't feed our soul. And we'll feed our soul with so much of the world, and we'll just wonder why what's going on in our lives, and we can't hear God and all that stuff, because we're not feeding ourselves. They were in the word of God every day. True story about a missionary that went and God used him to... Uh, as the instrument that this entire tribe from the chief all the way down to the youngest person got saved. He discipled them and worked with them for a couple years and then he moved on and worked in other places. And then when he came back about eight years, nine years later, he asked the chief one day, well, how is your life going with the Lord? And he goes, well, it all depends. He goes, well, it all depends on what? He goes, well, my life is like there's two dogs in my life. There's the dark dog, which is my old nature, and there is the new, fresh, white dog that is God's nature in me. And he goes, well, which dog's winning out? He goes, and this is the key point. It just depends on which one I feed the most. That chief understood that if he fed his spiritual life, it would grow and prosper. But if he fed his old nature, it would grow and prosper too. We need to be in the word of God. The bread of life. Jesus Christ has laid this out for us so that we can have this. Then they said, the second thing is fellowship, hanging out together. Now, the people will say, well, I don't need to go in to be inside a church to be with God. I can go down to the river. You know, in my place, I can go up and out in the desert someplace or up in the mountains or out on the beach and be with God and have that, have that church, me and God. 
just me and God. I go, great, how often do you do it? About once a year. So you're really spending tons of time with God, aren't you now, aren't you? But you know, if you understand the word of God in Hebrews, it tells us, forsake not the gathering of thy brethren, as some do, as the matter, as some are doing right now. But we need to encourage and exhort and, and, and have them come to fellowship. Oh, fellowship has so much dynamics to it. It's not just for you to come and, and lift up your voices and praise God and what a glorious time of worship we had this morning. But it's a time that you get to be with your brothers and sisters in Christ. And I look forward to coming to church. I really do because I hope you're this way. I expect God to talk to me. But I expect God to talk to me more than just the Bible study. Okay? I tell my congregation, and I'm, I'm banking on it today, one of you guys are going to say something to me that I know that's the Holy Spirit speaking to my heart about an issue that's going on in my life or something. One of you are going to say something to me. And the light bulb's going to go on. Oh, thank you, Jesus. So you never know what God wants to do with your life by just simply going to church in somebody else's life. Or somebody else is going to say something to you, and it's just going to go, that's the answer. And it didn't come from the sermon. Sorry, chick. But, <laughs> but God will use. He will use us in phenomenal ways. Fellowship. Well, people just say, well, I don't, I don't go to fellowship. No, that's not true. You do go to fellowship. You go to the fellowship of football games on TV. You go, go to all these other fellowships that you fill yourself up with that aren't spiritual, and the end result is you're feeding that old dog, and it's just not there. Fellowship is a critical thing that we need to do. The scripture is so clear. It says, neglect not, neglect not the gathering of the brethren. We need to make that a high priority. I actually read an article. It caught my attention. How to double your church size with never getting a new person in your church. Now, for a pastor, that's going to catch your attention, right? I go, all right, you got me. I'm going to read this whole article. And this is what he went on to explain. And after I finished reading the article, I go, you're right. You're right. <laughs> now I got you, don't I? You want to know what the article said? He goes, you typically have people who go to church every single Sunday. You know, unless they're sick or something. So you have your four times a, a month people. Then you have people that will go three times a month. Then you'll have people that will go just two times a month. Then you'll have people that go once a month. And then you have, what do you call those people, Marcy? Christmas and Easter? Creasters. Yeah. <laughs> you'll have creasters that come at Christmas and Easter. And he goes, if you can get the people that are coming three times, that every couple months they would increase that double if you could get even the people that go twice a month to come three times a month and if you could get the people that come once a month to come twice a month you've doubled your attendance without ever getting a new person and i went he's right <laughs> but that's not what god's called us to do god's called us to fellowship not to grow attendance but to grow ourselves in him that's the value of fellowship. And, and who we should be growing the church with are people that don't have churches to go to, people that don't know Jesus, people who God died for and gave his life for, that they could come to know the sweetness of the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. So fellowship is so critically important for us as individuals. The next thing it says is breaking of bread. And I take a little bit of an advantage with this one, if you would, and, and, and look at it with a cultural point of view. When they would take a piece of bread and they would eat, they would break it and they'd pass it to the next person and they would break it and they would eat it. But they didn't just take a piece of bread and break it for physical food. Because if you ate part of that bread and I ate part of that bread, because we ate the same bread together, we became one together. That was their culture. But in order to sit down and to eat and to break the same bread, you had to go through a lot of cleaning and washing. 
I mean, some of the Jews, they would wash in such a way that as they washed, they couldn't let the water go down their elbow and into their armpit and down like that. I mean, yucky stuff like that. They had to hold themselves out. The water would run down and drip off their elbows. But they had to wash and scrub and scrub so that when they broke the bread, they broke it with clean hands so that when they pass it over, they pass it over with clean hands. The whole thing to me in that picture is clean hands. But let's take that to a clean heart. If we want to really be right with God, we have to have not clean hands, but a clean heart. And there's not one of us that doesn't sin every single day. Yes, I'm a sinner. I sin every single day. And I thank God that I found a verse in there that has set me free. 1 John 1, 9, that it says that if I confess my sin, that he, that's God, is faithful and just to forgive me of my sins and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Oh, blessed be the name of God. Because I have lived. That's a life verse for me. <laughs> I mean, I use it all the time. God, I blew it again. I'm sorry. Forgive me. Wash me clean. Help me not to do that again. And it could be five minutes later, I'm praying the same verse again. But God loves us enough that he has allowed us to have that. So when we come to church and we come into the presence of God in our daily life, whether it's at church or at work or wherever, if we blow it, we can confess our sins and we're nice and clean. And then the next thing, so we have fellowship, or excuse me, the word of God, fellowship, confessing our sins, and then we have prayer. I love prayer because prayer is not something difficult, and a lot of people make it real difficult. And especially, you know, I, I've heard people say this, but since the King James isn't as popular in some <laughs> venues as it used to be, they, I would hear them say, uh, I can't pray because mine doesn't sound like King James version of prayer, you know, because these people would stand up, well, thou art the most high God, the almighty, you know, gosh, come on, who are you talking to, the ceiling? You know, what is prayer? I mean, is it perfect English? Well, I would fail because I don't think I'd ever speak a sentence without butchering part of it somewhere along the line. You know, it's just not there. So what is prayer? I found the best definition of prayer found in Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9 simply says that it was a time of his prayer and supplication. And in my prayer, as I talked to God. How many in here know how to talk? Raise your hands. Look, we got some liars going on again. You all know how to talk. If you can talk, you can pray. Because prayer is just talking with God. That's all it is. Prayer is talking with God. So just talk with God. Oh, yes, acknowledge who he is. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Holy. He's a holy Father. So you talk to God. It's prayer time. You lay your heart out. Cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. The general will of God. These are things that he wants us to do. The general will of God. These four things, if you look at them as four tires on an automobile, you've got a tire for the word of God reading, you've got a tire for fellowship, you've got a tire for confessing your sins, and you have a tire for prayer. Have you ever been driving down the road and got a flat tire? What typically happens when you get a flat tire? I know some people keep driving, but what typically happens? <laughs> what typically happens? You pull over. Have you ever had two flat tires in a, at the same time? Well, you know what? Spiritually, you can quit reading your word, and spiritually, you have a flat tire. And typically, when you quit reading your word, you feel bad about that, so you quit praying because you feel bad that you haven't been reading the word. Now you got two flat tires. And guess what? You cannot confess your sins unless you do what? Pray. Now you got three spiritual flat tires. And if you got three spiritual flat tires, guess where you don't want to be? In church with everyone else who's inflating their tires. You're spiritually got four flat tires because you're not being a doer of the word of God. You're just being a hearer of it like James says. So it's important that we do the general will of God. Now, why is it so important to do the general will of God? Well, number one, it pleases God. And isn't that why we've been created? To bring him pleasure? But it also brings in the second part of the specific will of God. 
Because I have found that when I read through the book of Acts, I see the specific will of God manifested as the apostles and the disciples were just living the general will of God. Let me repeat that. This is good stuff. Shake your head. Yeah, it's good stuff. Okay. As you live the general will of God, the specific will of God just manifests itself naturally. You don't have to strive for it. You don't have to try to manifest it. Let me give you an example. Acts chapter 3. You know the story. Peter and John are going down to the temple at the hour of prayer. Isn't prayer the general will of God? As they get down there, there's a beggar crying out, alms, alms, alms for the poor. Peter walks up to him and says, silver and gold have I not, but such as I have give I thee, reaches down and says, stand up and walk. And the scripture says that his ankle bones were healed immediately. And in the Greek, the ankle bones there, the, the thing that he had, they were, they were just not, no meat on the legs, but they were just bent in and distorted. But they say instantly, the ankles were healed, the feet were healed, and he went running and leaping and praising God through the temple. So much of a commotion he was making, and everyone had passed by him at that gate. He'd been there. He brought, was brought there since he was born that way. And then he grabbed hold of Peter and John. I can imagine him doing two headlocks, can't you? And just jumping up and down with him like that. So much of a commotion that thousands of people gathered around. And Peter began to share the gospel. And 5,000 people came to know the Lord that day from that event of them just going to do the general will of God. Now, what do you think Peter and John did when they woke up that morning? Do you think they, they, they looked at each other and said, what do you want to do today, John? I don't know, Peter. What do you want to do? I don't know. What do you want to do? I don't know. Well, Jesus told us we can't go fishing, so we can't go fishing. And, and I, I hear the walleye are really biting, but better not go fishing. Jesus told us not. Hey, hey Peter, I got an idea. You know, you know that lame guy down there that even Jesus walked past him, that guy that's on alms, alms, alms for the poor, alms, alms. Aren't you getting tired of that? I mean, every time I walk by, I want to put on my sunglasses, but they haven't been invented, so we can't put them on, just, just so he won't see me turning my face away from this guy. I just, I just don't want to be in there. Well, what do you want to do? He says, well, well, Peter, why don't you, you know, when he goes alms, alms, alms for the poor, just tell him, because we don't have any money. We just have silver and gold at my none, but such as I have, give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ, stand up and walk. And Peter goes, that's a great idea. But you do it, John. It was your idea. And he goes, oh, no, Peter, listen, you're the one that denied Jesus. And I still can't believe you did it to a girl. <laughs> A maiden girl? I don't know, Jesus, I don't know. I mean, and then you swore like a sailor. <laughs> this is a chance you get to redeem yourself. <laughs> well, I did do it with that girl, didn't I? <laughs> okay, but when we get in there, you, you give the message. No, no, you, you did it with a girl, Peter. Come on, you got to redeem yourself. All right, let's go down to the hour of prayer. You think they talk like that? Do you think they had any clue that God had a specific plan for them that day? Absolutely not. No idea whatsoever. They said, hey, it's time for the hour of prayer down at the temple. Let's go. What were they doing? The general will of God. And in the general will of God, boom, the specific will manifested itself. You see a picture here? We live the general will of God. The specific will will manifest itself. Now, Acts chapter 10, Cornelius is another example of that. You know that story where Cornelius was a centurion. He, he loved God, didn't know how to reach God, uh, but he was good to the Jews. An angel appeared to him and said, send a couple guys down to Joppa to get Peter down, and he's at the Tanner's house. And he'll come and he will uh, share a message with you. So he sent a couple guys. Peter went into the Tanner's house to get some, excuse me, <clears throat> to get some food wasn't ready so what did he do he redeemed the time he went under the porch to have a time with the lord and that's when those veil of unclean food came down 
and said, take and eat. And he said, no, I've never had anything unclean past my lips. And the third time came down each time. Hey, what God calls clean is clean. Don't you call it unclean anymore. And then there was a knock on the door. And these two guys arrived right at that time. And the angel told him, you go it up and you go with him or with them. The next morning they got up, they went down there. Peter, a Jew, went into Cornelius' house. And he said, why do you want me here? He told him about the angel, the whole story. He begins to share the gospel with him. Peter doesn't even get to the altar call, and the Holy Spirit falls on them. They get saved. They speak in tongues. And he says to them, who can prevent water to these Gentiles? They're filled with the Holy Ghost. They're saved. Now, what was Peter doing during that time? The general will of God. What was Cornelius doing during that time? The general will of God. And God manifested the specific will in their lives. Do that sometime. Read through the book of Acts, looking at the general will of God and see the specific wills coming out. Philip, another great example, one of my heroes in the Bible. Read about him and his life and how he lived the general will and the specific wills of God were manifested in his life. It is so critically important that we understand that. But let's be honest, there's going to be times that we're going to have to make decisions in our lives that we may not quite know what to do. You know, who do I marry? What car should I get? Not on the same level, by the way, okay? But how do I know who I should marry? You know, I, I don't know about any, you got any single guys in here? Yeah, anybody else? Okay. All right, let me teach you a lesson on what not to do for a wife. All right? I was a young Christian. I wanted to be married. I wanted so bad. And so I just said, okay, Lord, I'm going to go to church early. And I'm going to get there before anyone else does. I'm going to sit down in the pew because that church had pews. And the person that sits next to me, that's going to be my bride. That's the one I'm going to marry. And so I got down there early, and I sat there, and I was praying up a storm that the perfect girl would come, and the perfect girl would come, and my eyes are closed and shut tight. Oh, my heart's just so excited because I know God's going to answer my prayer because God answers every prayer, right? By the way, he does yes, no, or wait. That's a whole nother sermon. <laughs> That's a whole nother sermon in itself. And so he's sitting there, or I'm sitting there like this, and I hear the coming down. Oh, and my heart's like this. <laughs> and I feel them sit next to me. Oh, my heart's like this big time now. And I'm so excited. Okay, God, here it is. Here it is. And I open my eyes and oh, this glorious, gorgeous, blonde hair and a beard to match. <laughs> I said, okay, God, I got the picture. What do you want? And he, and he said, well, first of all, you got to find out if you're going to be married. So I prayed, and I said, if I'm not supposed to be married, take the desire away from me. The desire didn't go away. And then, so I went back to the Lord, and I started talking, and he said, well, you know how God speaks to you. Afterwards, it sounds much better a conversation than just your mind going through it, but you know that it's God speaking to you, amen? You know, you know what I'm talking about. Well, God says, you know, you're, you're this old right now. You think she's alive yet? I go, well, I don't think you want me to wait till I'm, you know, 54 to get married. So, yeah, I think she's alive. Well, then why don't you start praying for her as if she's already your wife? And so I did. I started praying faithfully that God, if she wasn't saved, would save her. If she was saved, that she would have a blessed time in devotions that day. If she had any struggles, you know, trials going on, that she would have wisdom on how to handle them. Uh, she would have victory in this area. She would, I, I just prayed as if she was there. So when I went down to El Centro to start the church, there was uh, a fellow that began to come down with me to worship. He met a young lady down there and wanted to get married. And as he got married, there was a reception, a wedding reception. You know, they go hand in hand. And there was a girl by the name of Colette. And Colette, I had, I had met, and I walked up to her who was speaking to another girl, and I just simply said, Hi, Colette, how you doing? She goes, oh, hi, Pete, I wanted you to meet Marcy. And I looked at Marcy, and I said to her, oh, I'll never forget your name. That's my mother's name. My mother's name was Marcy. And I said to myself right then on that spot, well, that sure was a stupid thing to say. <laughs> that was dumb. 
And then she said to herself, what kind of line is that? <laughs> so we just chatted, the three of us, and then I invited both of them to church the next day, and they decided to come. And afterwards, we were going out to a little le lake to do a little skiing, water skiing, and I invited them both to come, and we sat down at a bench and started to pray. And as we, or not started to pray, excuse me, we started to talk and get to know each other. And within three days, I knew that she was the one that I invested those thousands of prayers into. And I knew so much so that within a month, I asked her to marry me. And within three months, we were married on November 26, 1977. And it'll be our 34th anniversary coming up this in a couple months here. But that came about from a principle when you have to make a decision, how do you know what decision to make? That is your next anchor, Romans 14, 14a. It's such a valuable thing because there's specifics that the word of God just lines out for us, the do's that we should do and the things we shouldn't do. But there's times that we're not positive. You know, I've never found in the scripture that it said to me, move to El Centro and you're going to find Marcy who is Greek and Indian and all these other cultures, and that's who you're going to marry. It would be so easy, wouldn't it, that way? But it doesn't happen that way. But what happened is that Romans 14, 14, now, if you all know the story that there was the culture that the pagans would bring their sacrifices to their pagan gods, and their priests would go ahead and offer them. A third went to the sacrifice to be burned up, a third went to the priest, which was the best of the meat, and a third went to the person who gave the sacrifice. But because there were so many sacrifices, the priest set up these butcher's shops, and they would take the best of the meat, and they would sell them at reduced prices because they had so much meat to give. So the Jews or the Christians were wondering, is it okay to eat that meat that had been sacrificed? Some said yes, some said no. So they wrote Paul, and they asked him, should, is it wrong to eat meat sacrificed to And you know the whole story where he says, no, an idol is nothing, you can do it, but if it's going to stumble your brother, there's a real life source, if it's going to stumble your brother, even though you have liberty, don't do it. So we have liberty to do things, but if it stumbles someone, don't do it. But how did he come up with that decision? Romans 14, 14a says, I know and I am persuaded some of your versions will say convinced. I know and I am persuaded by the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not persuaded by my feelings. I'm not persuaded by my emotions. I'm not persuaded by my logic. I'm not persuaded by my friends, the peer pressure. I know and I'm persuaded by the Lord Jesus Christ. See, there's times in life we need to have confirmations. And those confirmations are very important in our life. And God will give you confirmations. He will show you and you will know that it is God. Actually, if a couple wants to get married, and, they, and I do the premarital counseling, I make them go through a list of Romans 14, 14a, where, the, where the, the guy writes down the list how he knows for a fact that these are things that God has spoken to him on, whether it's out of the word of God or by things that he knows are divine interventions that God has spoken to him. I make the girl do that, and then I have them after their own list come back and do a list together. And then the second counseling I have with them, that's the first thing we look at. We go over that list, and we just cross out the things that don't. I had one girl come back one time. She goes, oh, I've got to get into that appointment with Pastor Pete, and I, I need a confirmation. It's springtime in El Centro, beautiful time of the year. She goes, okay, okay, okay. All right, all right, you need a confirmation. Okay, if you really want me to marry this guy, then there will be a girl with a pink dress on. It's springtime. Girls wear pink dresses. And I looked at her and I said, sweetie, I don't think we can bet the ranch on that one. If you really wanted to make a confirmation about a dress to make sure it's God, you should have said, God, if you really want me to marry him, have a guy wear a pink dress. <laughs> Because these confirmations are from God, not coincidence. So let's scratch that one off. But I like this one, so I built her up on the other ones. Because I tell them that in marriage, and all those of you that are married, you know, you're so excited about marriage. But man, that's spiritual warfare. And there, Satan wants to destroy that marriage because it's the advertisement for the kingdom of God and for the marriage supper of the Lamb. 
And if you don't have confirmation that you're married, there are so many people that just get tired of each other that are Christians and divorce. Do you know that there's a, as much divorce in the body of Christ as there is in the world? Shame on us. Now, I understand there's grounds for divorce and there's times for divorce, but just because things aren't going well, well, let's get back and do the word of God and things will go well, amen? amen. We do the word of God. When Marcy and I, we wanted some, you know, to really know what was happening. And I'm not going to go through all of them, but my goodness, we got rock-solid commitments. We got commitments that we knew from God, confirmations, that is, that we knew beyond a shadow of a doubt. And those have been things that, in ministry, it's not easy. Marriage isn't, in, isn't easy, and marriage and ministry can be very difficult. To be quite honest, some of the greatest pains I've experienced in my Christian life have come from Christians and towards me as a pastor. Thank God, like I said to Jonathan, we do this as unto the Lord. You know, I'm sorry, guys. I'm not doing this today for you. I'm doing it for the Lord. And when you do that, it's a blessing because, you know, you get to get that sense of God, well done, good and faithful servant. And it doesn't matter if people say thank you or, you know, whatever, because you've done it unto the Lord. And that's what sustains us. But you need those confirmations at times. And God has given us so many confirmations in our marriage and held us together through Rocky. Marcy has never, ever once considered divorce. She has contemplated murder many a time. <laughs> that, that, that's not an original for me. I heard that from Billy Graham with his wife, Ruth. But, <laughs> but, uh, but I, I, I took it, okay? Oh, you know, life can be very difficult at times, but when we understand Revelation 4.11 that we have been created to bring God pleasure. When we understand the general will and we live the general will and we have the specific will manifested naturally with those confirmations, it's a great blessing. Then no matter what happens with Satan in our lives, because let's face it, even Jesus said in John chapter 16, verse 33, he said, in the world you're going to have what? Joy and happiness and everything's going to be peaches and cream. In the world, you're going to have what? Tribulation, trials, difficulties. But he said, be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. So we know that the world is going to throw at us a lot of difficult things. We know Satan has an agenda. And I want you to see what that agenda is. Just flip over quickly as we're going to get close to finishing up here. In chapter 1 of the book of Peter. 1 Peter, I mean, chapter 1, verse 5. Ah, let me start all over. 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. And here in 1 Peter chapter 5, we're going to see what Satan's goals are for us. In verse 6, it says, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all. You know what the word all in Greek means? All. Very good. You are great Greek students. Casting all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. Now listen, here is the job description of the devil. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He desires to devour you. He desires to destroy you and to wipe you out and to take advantage of your life and just ruin it. That's his desire. He wants to devour you. That's what your enemy is. I don't care how he presents himself to you. He wants to destroy you. And if you're a Christian, the only way that he can hurt God is to get you to fall out of fellowship and relationship with God. That's his desire, to destroy you. But God's desire is to grow you and to mature you and to bless you. And it starts up here when it said, casting all your cares upon him because he cares for you. And then look what he tells us to do. He tells us in verse 9, resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are experienced by your brotherhood that are in the world. But by the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect establish, strengthen, and settles you. Settles you. We are going to go through trials at times. 
We are going to go through difficult times, and it talks about it right here. And you're not the only one going through it. How many times have you thought to yourself, why me? You ever said those words? Why me? I must be the only one. You're not. You're not the only one. Your brothers in Christ, your sisters in Christ, they've gone through the same thing according to the scriptures. You're not the only one. And there's a purpose for going through trials. Some of them had no bearing on anything we did. Some of them are a direct result. You reap what you sow. But if we understand the process that is going on here, did you notice that process down there? It says, after you have suffered a while, he will perfect you. That word in the Greek for perfect is mature you. He will mature you, he will establish you, he will strengthen you, and he will settle you. Typically what happens for the, the, the Christian, and generally what we do, we go into suffering, and the very first thing that happens, we go, I want the settlement. Give me down to settle. All right. Suffer to settle. S.S. That's me. Right there. Right, right, that's all I want. Suffer, settle. Give me peace. Right now. Peace, peace, peace. And we don't even consider, is there a lesson in there for me to learn? That's one of the things I love about my wife so much. Whatever situation, good or bad, she's always praying, God, show me, teach me a lesson. There's got to be a lesson in this for me. This is so hard, but there's got to be a lesson in this for me. And what is that lesson? We see the, the blueprint right here where it says that he wants to mature us. He wants to establish us. Establish us is talking about roots. Have you ever had something that had a lot of roots that you're trying to get rid of? And if the roots are still there? There is a mulberry tree that a bird had flown by and dropped a seed and it started growing in our backyard. And I didn't want it. So every time I would go, I'd cut it with the lawnmower. And it would grow up i cut it again. it grow up, i cut it again. Every time I cut it, guess what? It grew back stronger and stronger. And finally, I said, you deserve to live. And it just took off. Why? Because its roots went deep. Trials can cause you to have your roots go deep in Christ. I don't care what happens when the storms of life come wailing down on you. If your roots are deep, you make it through the storm. And as that happens in you, I made it through this last one. And another one comes up. Hey, I made it through the last one. I can make it through this one. If you're a baby Christian here today, you're going to find that you think you have trials going on that are so devastating in your life. My, mark my word today that if the rapture doesn't take place in five years, you're not even going to remember these trials that you're going through today. They're going to be so small. And when you look back at them, you're going to go, those weren't trials. What a baby I was. <laughs> but, but I've often encouraged baby Christians and other people, no, 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 no. Don't compare yourself to that mature person that's been with the Lord 20 years and the trials they're going through. This is a real trial for you. And because it's a real trial for you, it's, it's an important thing to learn from. Because when you learn from that, then you're going to be able to take what you learn from that, and you're going to be able to build on it. I, I remember when I first started the ministry, I had no clue. I had absolutely no clue where a $250 window air conditioner was going to come from. And we're down there in the summertime, 120 degrees sometimes, just so the kids could have an air conditioner in the window in the building we were renting. But God provided, and then he provided, and then he provided. And so by those little teeny lessons, he built faith in me that when the next one is, and I heard someone say it one day, he goes, well, don't worry if it's a dollar and you need 10, it's just another zero added on. That's no problem for God. And if it's $100, it's two zeros. If it's a 1,000, it's four zeros. How many zeros can your God add on to it? And I go, wow. God took care of this little thing. He took care of this one, and he took care of this one. And so when we get to the major things, God, you have built faith in me in this. And I'll be honest, I pray this even now. I don't know how you're going to do it, but I know you're going to do it. And you're going to take care of it. That's what 
going through this means being established. And when you do that, then you become spiritually buffed. You become strong. And then guess what? As you go through that process, you learn, you become settled. You are going to eventually learn the lesson. If we have a path of life as Christians like this, and we go up this life here, and here's the crossroads of the trial, and if you choose not to follow it, you're going to go in a circle like this, you're going to come back onto your path, and you're going to have to face it later on down your Christian walk. And if you choose not to do it, you're going to go around the circle again. And choose not to do it, you're going to go around the circle again. And guess what? That's why we got so many dizzy Christians all over the place. Because <laughs> they choose not to learn their lessons. But if you choose to learn your lesson, you get strengthened, you get settled, you move on, and you become not only somebody that has learned a valuable lesson, you become a disciple that is now able to pass on a valuable lesson to other people. And so those are important lessons that we can take with our life. Those are anchors to our soul that should help us walk and enjoy our Christian experience. And as we grow in that, then we become like John the Baptist, the cousin of Jesus Christ. Saw Jesus walking one day and said, he must increase and I must decrease. And when we take that attitude in our life, Jesus, me, my flesh, my life, I want to decrease and I want you to increase in my life. And we apply these principles of pleasing God, you are going to become a disciple that is not only well pleasing to God, but a disciple of Jesus Christ that is going to be used by Him in ways that you can never imagine. I want you to stop and think about it. If I was your pastor here, would I have as great of an influence where you work? I wouldn't be able just to walk in and to share my life with Him. But wherever you work or wherever you're going to school, you have people all around you that are your mission field. St. Paul, the entire place, the entire area here is a mission field for you. And what a privilege that you can take these principles that we have learned today and apply them to this beautiful city, this gorgeous city that you guys live in. Well, thank you very much, and let's close with a word of prayer.